My name is Rebecca Keller. I am an artist and writer and professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. For the past five years or so, I've been doing a lot of work in public historic sites, both in the U.S. and in Europe. And this work began when I, um, I realized that these sites are, I, I think of them as palimpsests, which is a place that has a story buried in a story buried in another story. A palimpsest originally was a, a skin, a parchment, that was written on. And in order to be reused, people would scrape it down and then write another text over it. But eventually, what was underneath started to show through. And I realized that these, these sites are like that. They're layered with many stories. Um, and of course, only so much can be told at a time by the staff at these places. Often, they're kind of frozen in time. People visit once, and they don't need to visit again because they feel like they're static. So I've, I thought that these places were opportunities for um, creative engagement, for telling stories that linked, um, that, that complicated the narratives embedded in these sites, and that linked the past to uh, the historic past to our living present. The process begins with research. I do a lot of research into, um, into the site, into the history associated with the place and the people who worked there. Because the work that I do in these sites is often um, temporary I, and ephemeral, I realize that as an artist I have a certain freedom that the curators and the directors of these sites don't have. And that is that I can take things that are implied, that are suggested, um, and, and use them to develop additional narratives, to develop metaphors, to develop tropes, um, and take, take some freedom, make some poetry of these places. So they become, um, I, the engagement I make with them is very, is, is very creative. It's the, the engagement of a poet or an artist um, informed by historic research rather than that of a, of a straight historian. Uh, the term that I've kind of coined for this process or for the works that result is site complicit. There's a very well-known term of the past 30, 40 years in art called site-specific, but it, it's, a very, it's become very general and very vague. For me, these works are, the work that I do are in very um, kind of deep dialogue with the site. And they, they are in complicity with the site to tell um, an additional story or a new story to tease out new narratives, new associations, uh, metaphors that make the place uh, less static and more alive, more, more connected to our contemporary life and sensibility than they might be otherwise. This was my first opportunity to work in an artist's home, in an artist's studio, and to sort of have that conversation across the decades with another artist. One of the things that working in this manner uh, requires is that unlike in an art museum, when, when I have my work in an art museum, an art museum's job is to put up art and to make the art look good and to interpret the art. Um, but a historic site, I am not their primary job. I'm, you know, obviously I'm invited here and they've been very welcoming and very supportive, but they, it's still a historic site. The building is fragile in some ways. It doesn't have the kind of electricity. It doesn't have, you know, it's not designed to be a showcase for contemporary art. One of the challenges of working in these sites is to come up with um, installations that make large conceptual claims and that, um, that can really um, engage the work that aren't too subtle where people miss them, um, but that make, that sit very lightly in the space physically, that don't require, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of electricity, that don't require me to be pounding into walls or painting walls or doing a lot of heavy work on site because it doesn't, it doesn't um, make sense, it's not appropriate. So one of the challenges of this kind of work is to figure out ways to 
once I've done my research, identified some themes, identified some metaphors, um, and identified some materials that seem to me conceptually appropriate for what I want to do, then I have to figure out how to make it work in the actual space, given the limitations of a historic house that, that is a little fragile. And also, um, in a house like this, where the public um, is not necessarily allowed to go everywhere. Um, so I also then work with the volunteers and the guides who are taking the people through um, to incorporate the additional, the, the layer of the palimpsest that I am adding into the information they usually deal with and the interpretation they usually deal with when they take people through the house. This was kind of his retreat, but he was very active socially. He carried on a large correspondence and a lot of people came to see him here. And going through his guest books at the Chapin Library, I realized um, that this guy was so connected to American arts and letters. I came to, to recognize that he was a, a hinge figure between the 19th century arts and letters and the 20th century. Um, for example, at the Chapin Library in one of, of the scrapbooks, I came across an invitation that Mark Twain had sent the family and a wedding announcement for Mark Twain's daughter. And at the same time, letters from, um, or, or notes about when Isadora Duncan visited Chesterwood. So I thought, that, that's, this is something that I often find um, in, in this kind of work, where two kind of disparate facts rub up against one another and they really kind of snap things into focus for me. And that was one of those moments because I realized this guy is really a hinge between the modernism of the 20th century and the sort of the America of the 19th century. I identified several themes going forward in this project. One was the social milieu, this connectedness to American arts and letters. Another was the idea of nature as a path to the sublime, which of course is connected very much to the transcendentalists and the people that he knew growing up in Concord. And it shows up in his artwork. So this idea of nature as a path to sublime, but also nature as a thing of study. One of his closest friends was an ornithologist. Among his correspondents, I did a piece in the house that we're going to be looking at in a moment about this social milieu. It wasn't just arts and letters, it was also scientists, landscape architects, people who um, were, were studying nature in a way that was a little bit more analytical. At the same time, he had this, this sort of uh, connection to these, the transcendentalist poets and this idea of nature as this, this pathway to um, inner peace to greater sort of knowledge. Um, one piece of writing that became very significant for me was an essay that his daughter wrote. And his daughter, of course, lived here. Her presence is very much also in the house. And um, she wrote this essay about their Sunday morning walks. And it was quite clear that they did this instead of going to church. It was a very long essay about this, the beauty of the landscape and the walks they would take and what he would do with Nate, the, the rocks and what he how he would frame a view and how he would talk to her about a leaf or a tree or a plant. Um, that became very significant. So the second trope, in addition to this social connectedness, is this nature, is this, this um, gateway to um, serenity, to a larger kind of spirituality in a way. The kind of sculpture that he made is not a sculptural language that contemporary sculptors use very much anymore. It's not a, a methodology, you know, the clay into plaster. But it's also the language that he used, um, a lot of allegory, things like that. We don't, you don't see it that much anymore in contemporary sculpture. One of the images that seemed to me to connect many of these things was the image of the wing. The first drawing he ever made was a study of a bird's wing. The wing, of course, is, uh, is symbolic and allegorical, and he included wings in many of his sculptures that were not of an actual person like Lincoln or Washington. So if you look at his work, you see angels' wings and, and um, winged figures all over the place. So I started thinking about using a wing as something that connects both this kind of allegorical 
subliminals, you know, idea of nature as symbolic of higher aspirations, but also of nature in its, in its actuality, in its physicality. And both of those things are reflected in this landscape. So I started using um, the trope as a wing and put that throughout Laos. The third sort of major approach has to do with the writing, because what we know of French is primarily through text and writing. And I, of course, read a lot of his letters and saw photocopies of his guest books, saw the actual scrapbooks that were kept by his daughter and by him. And I started thinking about how I could reflect some of this text, some of this writing in the piece. When we go inside, you'll see that um, some of the rooms are very, they're very full. There's a lot of stuff in them. And visitors aren't actually allowed to go in the room, so they stand in the doorway and look. Because the rooms are so full of artifacts and, and objects and artworks that the French is owned, I thought the only way, you know, realistically, the only way that I could do anything in those rooms was to use the windows. So sometimes, you know, the, the challenges with historic houses that I mentioned before, when you don't have a, a white wall, white box gallery, um, sometimes that means that you have to look for opportunities um, and be fairly strategic about, you know, where you can place work and how you can place it. So it became apparent that in some of the rooms toward the front of the house, the only thing that I could really do would be to use the windows. But museums put signs on windows all the time, and I thought that would be sort of not that interesting. So how could I make that text more interesting? How could I use uh, the windows um, in a way that was more artful? And I had become totally uh, charmed by French's handwriting. Like all of us, he had a scrawl, but like many architects and artists, on his more formal, you know, um, plans and, and drawings and things, he had this very um, stylized, very beautiful handwriting. And I decided that I would use that handwriting to, to um, put these texts on the window and have them, basically, I sort of, I took every sample of his handwriting I could find and um, in, a, in a computer sort of cobbled it together to form a font in a way. Um, took the M from this and the Y from that and tried to match them up and uh, had them vectored out and printed on um, a, tra a trans semi-transparent vinyl which I then placed on the windows. So the text on the windows are, are both from, and the doors, are both from him and from his daughter quoting him on these walks that they took. And they're in his handwriting. So it looks like the house is speaking. Um, so that's another sort of strategy that I employed uh, that um, takes this, that tries to make this information active and tries to connect it to our contemporary concerns. Um, but do so so that it sits appropriately in the house and works physically, conceptually, and aesthetically. And then finally, I also turned the former kitchen into a working studio, so a site of active cultural production. And I used, again, from archival research, I found photographs that he, his, he had, had taken in his studio, both here and in New York, working photographs of his sculpture as it was in process or before he shipped it. They were very beautiful, but they were, you know, glass negatives, they were scratched up. So I s scanned and reproduced them in Photoshop, uh, scaled them up, had them printed with archival ink on really beautiful watercolor paper, and used those as the basis for some drawings and studies, some of which are less formal, some of which are more interpretive, and some of which are meant to be standalone, you know, drawings, um, and those are in the kitchen. In addition, I also made a few pieces, you know, the, the, the language of sculpture, especially the, the, the way that he pursued it with clay and plaster, and I found very resonant in terms of my working process, the idea of veiling and unveiling, of, of uncovering. 
Um, I have kind of an umbrella term for these projects that I do, which is called excavating history. And one of the things that he did is he, you know, did a lot of digging into clay. So I made a few pieces that speak to that process, to his process, and that also kind of express my contemporary love for ma leaving material as material, not trying to make it look like something else. So there's a few things that I've done with, um, with clay, with the kind of clay he used, plasticine, um, that you know, shows the marks, shows the hand, and also uses this, this handwriting that I got really good at, mimicking this handwriting of his. So in the kitchen, we'll see, um, I built a, just a square frame, packed it with hardware, cloth, you know, metal mesh, and plasticine, which is the exact same way that he created many of the relief sculptures that are in his, you know, in the, the gallery. And then carved into it with the exact kind of tools that he used to model clay. A quote from Emily Dickinson. Dickinson wrote him a letter after his initial success. And she said, success is dust, but an aim forever touched with dew. And I started thinking, what else is clay but dust touched with dew? So I carved this into a hunk of clay in a frame, the way that he would have worked it. But I've left it as that. And, and so this, what in his time would have been kind of a half-finished slab, for me, I think is very beautiful as a finished piece. So that, that's also in the kitchen for people to take a look at.